understanding the value of your time. I know I mentioned that a lot, but you know, if you're not the expert and you're not the best, then just outsource, out, outsource it to someone that is and understand that your time is so, so valuable. The Gentech Podcast discussing business, investing, and marketing. Hey guys, welcome back to Gentech Podcast, bringing you valuable and inspirational discussion with top business owners. Today we have on Madison Masterson, CEO, model, influencer, independent contractor, and she is the owner of Mad Marketing. So I'm really excited to talk to her today about influencer marketing and how she uses social media in her business and her advice to other aspiring business owners. So Madison, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to learn more about you. Um, so let's just dive in. Um, did you what did you go to school for? Did you get a degree? Yeah, so um, I first studied at Harvard when I was 17 years old. That was my first kind of uh, college experience. I had a, a very untraditional background. Um, I struggle with multiple disabilities, uh, one specifically being epilepsy. So when I was younger, all throughout high school, I was actually homeschooled and doctors told me like that upper education would be practically impossible for me. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up applying for this special program for high schoolers to go study at, at Harvard and got in, ended up going. Um, and that was kind of the day that I decided, like, I am going to go to college. I am going to get an education. Uh, I ended up going to the University of South Florida. So uh, go Bulls. Uh, but I got my undergraduate degree there in marketing. Uh, and then I also got a master's degree there as well in marketing with specialization in social media and branding. That's amazing. You know, going to Harvard after you said, you know, you got diagnosed with um, epilepsy. I think that just shows so much about you and how you're a hard worker and you didn't even think you were going to, you know, be able to do that at first. So that's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. So, you know, you're at USF, you're getting your um, degree in marketing. Did you ever think you would have your own marketing agency or you were kind of thinking, you know, maybe work for other people? How did your journey start into your entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I definitely never thought that I was going to go into marketing. When I went to the University of South Florida, I was actually originally a classical ballet major. Um, I have always been a very creative person. And the way I actually got into this field was through social media influencing before I knew that it was called social media influencing. Um, during this time when I was having a lot of seizures and homeschooled, I had, you know, no friends. And during that's kind of the time of your life when you're really making social connections, making friends, having fun in high school. Um, and I didn't have that. So I started posting on social media and gaining a pretty big following uh, on different platforms, some that no longer even exist, which is crazy wow. to think about. Mm -hmm. um, but when I came to USF, I was just planning on my main goal always was to open a business. I wanted to open up a dance studio was my like original goal when I came to USF. Uh, I ended up having a career ending injury. So I tore my ACL and they said that um, dancing probably professionally wouldn't be the best idea for me. So I was majorless. And again, I was like, oh, I didn't even think I was going to go to college. Now I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. I ended up going into business just because I'd always heard you know, business is good for everyone. Uh, one of my first business classes I ever took was intro to basic marketing at the University of South Florida. Uh, I'm one of those students that really like raises my hand a lot, gets involved. I was answering a lot of questions and kind of talking about my journey with monetizing my social media platform from a young age and uh, making money that way. After class, uh, the professor had brought me aside and was like, what's your major? I was like, I don't have a major. I'm majorless. She's like, you're going to be a marketing major. Like, you need to change your major. I uh, ended up changing my major, became very passionate about it. Pretty much right when I changed my major, I started freelance marketing um, and doing influencer marketing campaigns for businesses. I started doing uh, paid social, like Facebook ads, pretty much any marketing I could get my hands on, any client I could get my hands on, I would do. Um, and then that kind of turned into from me being a person a company of one being a frail freelancer to kind of hiring independent contractors interns and then turning it into an actual agency so that was kind of how that happened yeah so what year was that that you first started college and you were already influencing 
Um, I started college in 2015. Um, I started influencing, I think about 11 years ago. So I don't know what year that was off the top of my head, but um, I started originally on Tumblr and then I went to a social media that no longer exists. It was called Feed. Very weird. It was kind of like all the social medias mashed together. It was a very niche platform. Um, and then I went to Instagram and built followings from there and uh, kind of got into building like really niche community based uh, followings, you know, ones where uh, it didn't feel as much of as, as my followers, they were more of like a community and we all really got to know each other in a way. Yeah. And that's amazing that you had to, or you got the opportunity to turn your interests into your career. You were already using social media. You knew how to make money from it. And you were an influencer before influencing was even a thing. So that's really amazing that, you know, you already knew that you were really passionate about marketing and good at marketing. And that professor kind of like spotted that for you. Do you think you would have done it without him? Um, it was actually a her. Uh, Prob pro maybe I honestly don't even know what I would have done. I maybe would have got a general business degree. Um, my father had an MBA, so I I always had it in the back of my head that I really wanted to go back to Harvard to get a degree. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas were always an MBA. So uh, would I've gotten to marketing without them? Probably. Would I have gotten into it as quick, quickly as I did? Probably not. So I really owe that professor a lot when it comes to helping me see my potential, even when I kind of didn't see it myself. Yeah. And, and that really is truly amazing. So where did the idea come about for Mad Marketing? I'm guessing Mad is like a little spin on your name. Yeah, I actually have to give credit to one of my interns a couple years back. She's actually who came up with the the name Mad Marketing. The my agency was actually originally called Madison Masterson Marketing. It was, you know, me and then we had like a team of four and um once the team started growing, I wanted to rebrand and I wanted to change the name, I wanted to change the, the colors, things like that. Actually strategically think about our branding. And I had an intern on my team that uh, semester. Uh, her name was Katie. Shout out to her. Uh, she was an amazing intern. And uh, she actually came up with the idea of mad marketing. She thought it was a really cute play on my name. Uh, we kind of went with that. And we tried a couple of different brandings we went through until we finally came to uh, what we have now. Yeah, I love the name. Um, how was it rebranding, you know, from like a whole new name? Obviously, it was close to the old one, but rebranding with, you know, a new logo, new colors can be really hard for businesses. Like what advice would you have or what were your steps with rebranding? Yeah, I think rebranding was very, very difficult. Um, and it still has difficulties to this day where, um, especially as a young business owner, kind of questioning the decisions that I've made, like, oh, maybe I should change this or that. Um, I, I would say my biggest advice for business owners when it comes to rebranding is that, you know, once you've come up with that strategic plan and you, you, no one knows your business better than you do. Once you've come up with that plan and you've come up with that branding, just really stick with it and be, be confident with the decisions that you've made, but also be open-minded to industry changes that might need small tweaks uh, through AB testing, trial and error, things like that. Yeah, that's great advice. So again, you're not just a CEO, you're an independent contractor, you're an influencer, you're a singer, you're a model. So how do you balance all of this? And you know, when did you like, come Wait, how do you have the time? <laughs> Basically? Ah, oh, that is a fantastic question. Um, I would say a lot of times I don't have the time that is an issue I run into. And I think the, the first thing that I realized when becoming a business owner was that time is the most precious resource that you have. And that's when I became I began uh, outsourcing things. And I think that is something that is so, so, so important to do is to realize what you're best at and just focus only on what you are best at. If you're not best at it, then outsource it to someone else because you should be focusing on what you do best. And that that's pretty much what I did and what I've been trying to do even more. Yeah, that's great advice. I do feel like many business owners try to wear all these different hats and, you know, they don't really realize that they can't until, you know, they fail or they become so overwhelmed. So it's good that like you realize that now. So with your um, independent contracting, what do you exactly do? 
Yeah, so I have done independent contracting for a lot of different businesses, especially startups. Um, I started doing the independent contracting for small startups that were just beginning to help organize and develop a marketing team structure for them. Um, something that I got really good at was structuring organizations and figuring out how to recruit, hire, uh, all of that. And for an early stage startup, it's very difficult to hire an HR person, someone that recruits, someone that does uh the operations so it's really nice to have one person that could come in really organize uh your team and then leave you a structured team that you can work with uh when they're ready to go so that's something that i do and for influencing um so i do want to tell our our, our listeners that you do have over twenty five thousand followers on instagram but you know before you had that big following how did you find these companies to send you products and for them to sponsor you and for you to be their influencer? Yeah, I guess in the beginning, especially, I, I just got really lucky because the market was honestly very undersaturated in comparison to it now being very oversaturated. Uh, when I first started monetizing my platform, most of my sponsors came to me. The biggest thing was always having call to actions in, in posts like, here's my email, um, you know, or sometimes it was DM my Instagram if you want to collaborate. And that that goes to brands, but also as when I was starting to do modeling also to like photographers, networking in the area, um, and really, really just being consistent for a long time. I was just posting to post, posting for fun and posting to kind of explain my story. And the sponsors kind of just came out of thin air in a way. They started emailing me um, and then one sponsor would introduce me to another sponsor that would introduce me to another sponsor. So to me, it's really about networking. And I think that goes into every industry and every field that uh, you can go out there and you can send a hundred cold emails and you can play the numbers game. And yeah, you, you might get four sponsorships out of that. But again, it goes back to how valuable your time is. So really just focusing on getting your name out in your industry and then the sponsors will kind of come find you and they'll ask you if they if you think that they'll be a good fit for your brand. And I think that's also great advice, like having, you know, your industry and your niche, because I do feel like there's so like you said, the influencer, um, it's just oversaturated right now. There's so many people who want to be influencers. They're nano influencers, micro influencers, macro influencers, mega influencers. Like it's just crazy the possibilities. But um, it's I do think it's great advice to have a specific niche and then you know focus on those type of industries instead of just kind of doing everything. So you said in the beginning you would take on everything. Are you a little more like picky now with what you influence and what you show your audience? Oh, mo 100%. Yes. I, I, you know, something that I've also in the recent years become, it's become a lot more important to me is my own mental health. Um, you might notice by looking at my Instagram, I've taken like an eight month hiatus from Instagram. And uh, that's a really, really difficult decision for a lot of influencers to make, especially at the time that was my primary source of income. Um, but it wasn't making me happy at the time. Uh, and a lot of the sponsorships that I was getting, I felt had to be forced, uh, things like that. So that's why I took time for myself. Um, but as you said, yeah, in the beginning, pretty much every sponsor that came my way, even if it was like a gifted collaboration to me, I was like, oh, it's free. Like send it to me. I'll post it. I'm just posting for fun. It became, it, it went from that to, you know, taking in, into consideration my audience and if they would want to see this, taking into consideration if this would be authentic to myself, if it's products I already use or products that I would use. Um, and then also compensation and back to that, how valuable your time is as an entrepreneur. I'm not going to, I no longer will take on sponsorships that the compensation to me is not worth my time, energy to get ready, come up with the concepts, take it, take the photos, take the videos, edit it, post it. You know, people don't think about how much goes into it, but again, your time is valuable. You should be co compensated for that. Yeah, that's great advice. A lot of influencers get taken advantage of because they really don't realize their value and you know what they deserve. So I think that is really awesome advice. What, um, 
what would you say to someone who wants to be an influencer and has no idea what type of pricing? I've heard 1% of your followers before or... Yeah, so pricing is something that I think is highly debated for a reason. And I don't think that there's any way to really have a mathematical equation to how you should be compensated as an influencer. Um, advice I always give influencers is, and I know this is difficult, but to kind of put a value to your time. So, you know, if you think that this project is going to take up three hours of your time, how much would, would you need to be compensated for that to be worth it to you? And this may be a, you know, an unpopular opinion, but if you're okay with being compensated less than, and you want to do that brand deal, then I say do that brand deal. If you want to be compensated more than fight for what you're worth. Uh, another thing to take into consideration with compensation is compensation. It, it is all dependent on, you know, the amount of deliverables, not only your vanity metrics, like your followers engagement, but also how closely matched your audience is. You know, you can have a million followers as an influencer, but if a beauty brand comes to you and, you know, your following is mostly based on sex appeal, let's say, and 90% of your followers are men, you're going to really cut yourself short on a lot of brand deals because, you know, 90% of your audience are men. They're not going to pay those mega prices that most people with a million followers would get to sell a beauty brand to your 90% male audience. So there's a lot that goes into, and I, I really can't say exactly how to compensate. Uh, the main things is niche, you know, if you're, if you're the niche, in, uh, the niche, the niche uh, industry leader, like, let's say you have a very small niche, and you're the industry leader, and there's a product that is exactly in your niche, you can ask for a lot more money, because your audience perfectly fits that product. So it really depends on that putting a value to your time. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that you're fairly compensated, whatever that means to you. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's such great advice to, you know, anyone who wants to be an influencer right now. A lot of people do. So um, I just want to transition a little bit. What were some challenges that you had at the beginning of your journey or, you know, even recently with starting a business and <clears throat> being an influencer? Yeah, um, I there's been so many challenges. I think the first challenge that I really had to deal with with social media, um, as I said, I, I was really bullied when I was younger. I had disability. I have disabilities. Um, so I went to social media for like love and friends. And don't get me wrong. I really I really did get that. And I was blessed to have some people that made it so worth it to keep going in life. But as everyone knows, social media also can be extremely toxic. And even at a young age, when I feel like my brain was not developed enough to comprehend the hate that I was getting, I got cyberbullied a lot online. I got a lot of hate, especially on, you know, just a normal picture. Let's say I was 16 years old and I took a, a selfie and there's people calling me ugly, you know, calling me so many rude things. That was really, really difficult on me as a as a young person. And even now, I'm a sensitive person. When people give hateful comments, it hurts my feelings. Uh, and that's definitely a challenge that I've had is kind of getting thicker skin and realizing that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, someone's going to disagree with it. Someone's going to hate it. And as long as you're proud of your work, that's all that really matters. Uh, and then my other main main issue that I've had challenge that I've had has been my my disabilities, um, struggling with health issues, you know, having amazing time management skills only gets you so far when you had your time your day planned out, and then you have a seizure and your day is now completely messed up, you no longer can really work well. That's the type of things that have definitely been very difficult for me. But I've gotten through those by just always having a goal in mind and keep and keep it, I keep telling myself this may be difficult now, but this is all this is all going to be worth it once I get to that goal that I'm working so hard for. Yeah, well, that's really amazing. Again, thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, so, you know, to transition from that, what's your biggest accomplish, accomplishments that you want to share? Um, I saw you had an article in BuzzFeed that I read, and that's amazing and super impressive. How'd you accomplish that? Did you send it in or I don't know how that works? Yeah, yeah, I just wrote it and sent it in to BuzzFeed. That was a, a fun thing. That was actually something that a professor at USF uh, encouraged me to do. So that was fun. I would say my 
my biggest personal personal accomplishments uh with influencing i would say my adidas sponsorship um you know that was another one i didn't email them i didn't go to them they really just came to me with this collaboration and i think that was that was my biggest uh sole collaboration i've ever had not not only brand wise but compensation wise so i was really really proud of that uh, at the time and then i would say one of my biggest accomplishments at as a professional uh, at my own my own agency was starting my internship and mentorship program uh, i am so proud of my internship and mentorship program and what it's become i mean every single semester we get two to three hundred applicants per position it's it's a really really difficult process to even narrow down but i am so thankful for my interns every semester i have gotten to know them in, in such an uh, amazing way and see them flourish. And especially some of my interns from when I first started the program, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. They didn't know what they were doing. We were working together and to see them go on to wonderful careers, like getting into Duke for grad school, starting their own businesses, becoming influencers or entrepreneurs themselves. Um, and, you know, those coming back to me and saying that I had an impact on their life. That to me has been my biggest accomplishment. Yeah, that's incredible. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about um, your mentorship and internship program and maybe how people can apply? Yeah, definitely. So every single semester at Mad Marketing, we run an internship and mentorship program. Um, we try to make it as inclusive as possible. It's an unpaid internship, uh, but it's it's a low commitment internship. So it's only 10 hours a week. We do that again because we understand that students need to work to survive in this you know world to pay for their education there's a lot of internships that are 40 plus hours of unpaid labor which i think is just ridiculous uh something that's really interesting about our internship is uh the interns have a say in what they're doing and what they're learning so they get to come to me and say what type of task they would be more interested in learning um, and they also have me as a personal mentor all throughout the internship but also for eternity after as long as they graduate in good standing so we have a pretty cool alumni program with all of the interns and um you know, throughout it, they get to dip their toes in a lot of things like PR, influencer marketing, lead generation, SEO, um, pretty much everything, content creation, social media management. So they get to learn a little bit about everything. And we have speakers that come in. We have workshops like LinkedIn audits and resume audits. Uh, we really try to set up our interns for success after our internships. Yeah, that really does sound amazing. So if anyone wants to apply, how will they apply? Yes, yes. Uh, applications are always on LinkedIn. So if you follow uh, Mad Marketing on LinkedIn, I believe you should be notified or there's a way to press the job alert. Um, we are actually currently, forget which one we're currently, we're currently recruiting for the PR version of the mentorship program. Uh, sadly, the marketing one has already closed for this semester. But uh, if you want to do a PR internship, you can apply right now. I think the application closes in about a week and a half. So for you, how do you continue your education to keep learning? What are some self-improvement tips or tasks that you have? Yeah, well, um, going to get a master's degree was a way that I definitely continue my education. Um, I also serve as an advisory board member for uh, one of the executive courses that USF does. And I'm always learning with that, learning from others. Um, and I continue to try to learn new things by following on social trends you know what always doing new certifications courses but especially by building a network i think one of the best ways to be a lifelong learner is not only in learning from courses and learning from books but to also learn from people and growing your network getting to know new people and asking them questions that most people wouldn't ask is a way that i really have been blessed to continue learning even after my academic education has ended and I also want to say I saw that you were 25 under 25 for USF. That's amazing. How'd that feel? Yeah, that was one of my big goals uh, right when I joined the Muma College of Business. It was a, a big goal of mine to, to get that award. Um, so, you know, getting that award felt amazing. It was such a good accomplishment. It was really sad because I got it the year that COVID became a thing. So uh, that definitely put a little bit of a damper on things. You know, we didn't get to have our celebrations in at all really we didn't get to you know do a lot of things but it was still such an amazing accomplishment and i felt so blessed to be one of the recipients when there were just so many amazing students that year and every year yeah that must feel incredible 
So with your, your career, what are some skills that you found vital? Definitely, I would say I, I could focus on hard skills easily, you know, uh, but I think that the skills that have been the most vital in my career have actually been my soft skills, uh, learning how to communicate eff effectively, not only to native English speakers, not only to people that have come from the same background as you, but learning how to communicate in a way that uh, people from lots of backgrounds can understand you. Uh, that's been a really, really amazing vital skill to have. Uh, another skill that I would say has been really vital has been uh, like recruiting skills, learning how to uh, get to know someone in a short period of time and seeing if they are valuable talent. Uh, that has been a very, very valuable skill because again, time is very precious and a lot of times interviews go so quickly and there's so many people that uh, learning what makes someone stand out and what makes someone end up being a great employee is usually how trainable they are. And uh, that's been a great skill. And then I'd say finally, one of the skills that I think are the most beneficial to my influencing career was actually my photography skills. Uh, I got into photography uh, when I was really, really young. And that actually played into getting into influencing, which played into getting into marketing. So that skill really, really helped me all throughout my career. Yeah, definitely. Those are definitely amazing skills to have with your career. So now I just want to transition into social media. And the first question I'll ask is, what are your favorite social media platforms? Definitely. Uh, I would say my, my all time favorite is definitely still Instagram. Uh, I'm in, I stick with Instagram. I love it so much because I love photo content. Mm -hmm. um, I know Instagram is trying to change into video and I enjoy that stuff as well. But photo content, I just love. Uh, I would say my second favorite is TikTok. Uh, one of the reasons why I don't like TikTok as much as Instagram is actually because of how addicting it is. Um, as I said, time is very precious and I get very angry in a way at myself if I spend like four hours just scrolling through TikTok and it's so easy to do that on that platform, which is good for them. That's obviously great for their platform. Just not that. <laughs> exactly. But just not good for me. Um, the only platform, social media platform that I really don't like is Twitter um uh, i'm not a big twitter person i don't i don't even think i i might have a twitter but i don't think i have a twitter um but oh and linkedin can't forget linkedin i'm actually yeah. a official linkedin creator so i gotta mention them i really love linkedin linkedin's a great way to network meet people uh and it's a great content platform as well i've it's been really cool watching so many new content creators pop on to linkedin and see how the content is really changing on that platform right now I completely agree. I've seen such a shift in LinkedIn. Like what people are posting is like now changing to be more of Facebook. And I honestly do love that, but um, completely agree with you. Love Instagram, um, love TikTok, but also hate it. And yeah, I don't use Twitter either. I don't think many businesses do, but <laughs> so, what do you think? Do you like Facebook? Do you use Facebook a lot? Yeah, I mean, Facebook is great um, for a couple reasons. Ads, obviously, um, that's getting a little bit more difficult with rules. Uh, but Gentech, you know, Gentech's got that down with their Facebook ads. Um, so that's a great way to use it. I also just love Facebook personal use uh, because of staying in contact with friends and family. And um, I think it's a great platform for that. So I think that I use it for that more than for business, but there are a lot of ways that I use Facebook for my clients for business. So it really depends on your niche and you know what you, what you want to focus on. Yeah, definitely. And what methods do you use to promote mad marketing or even promote yourself? Yeah, I, I think that most of the promotion for mad marketing comes organically from promoting myself. So that's kind of uh, the strategy that we've taken on that's worked the best, um, especially through LinkedIn. Um, and Instagram, but especially through LinkedIn, I think I get the majority of my leads through LinkedIn and through posting, through uh, applying for independent contractor jobs. That was one of the ways I started doing independent contracting on top of the mad marketing. Um, so 
I would say mostly through link, LinkedIn and through organic content is the number way that I would promote myself, but also doing collaborations with people is a great way to promote yourself. You know, um, I actually have a LinkedIn event coming up soon with one of my uh, social media besties named Kristen. We're going to be talking about influencer marketing. So I think it's great to find other people that are in your industry in a way and collaborate with them. Yeah. Is it a webinar? Yeah, it's a LinkedIn live event. So we're going to be talking about influencing for creators and for businesses. So kind of if you want to be an influencer, uh, Kristen is actually an influencer mentor and coach. She'll be talking about that. And then uh, I'll be talking about influencing as well from the business side. And there'll also be a Q&A for people to ask questions. So. That's awesome. I'll go to it. <laughs> hey, yeah, we'll, we'll see you there. Awesome. And I do want to ask, how did you become a LinkedIn creator? Um, I... I honestly started becoming very passionate about LinkedIn right when I joined the Mooma College of Business. I, I was told I, I joined a business fraternity when I was in college. And one of the things that were like a big requirement was to have a LinkedIn and to work on your LinkedIn shows shout out to Delta Sigma Pi. Um, but I started kind of just connecting with a lot of people from my university and then started posting and kind of went from there. And then uh you know, got reached out, joined the program and became a LinkedIn creator. So it's been really fun. I think the best benefit of it is uh, getting to talk to talk to people at LinkedIn directly about types of features you would want added where we have that ability to really have our voice heard as creators and uh, especially because they're trying to make a shift to more of a creator site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also see Instagram doing that too. I know they're definitely. paying people for reels now, so definitely taking a page out of TikTok's book with that. Oh yeah, definitely. That's a big shift that I think every all of the platforms are either making or going to have to make because the creator economy has become so important and so popular for every brand. Almost every brand's going to use it in their marketing budget somehow. Um, so the platforms themselves you know, got to get on board to keep their creators or they're going to lose them, going to yep. go somewhere else. And I know this is kind of general, but what would you say the importance is for you with social media? What is the importance of social media in your business? I think the one of the most important things of social media in general is to drive community. Um, obviously, if social media didn't exist, my business would not exist at all. So it's very important <laughs> for my business in that way. But also, in a, in a general case, uh, for all of my clients, we, we focus on community based marketing, we don't we try to not focus as much on, van on vanity metrics and more on having your community be very loyal to you, you know, you go back to those case studies of the influencers that have millions of followers and can't sell more than four t shirts, but then we have some micro influencers that can make stores sell out in a second. So uh, community is very important. Definitely. And you also see how crazy it is with TikTok. You don't even have to be an influencer to sell things out anymore. You just have to go viral and anyone can, which is really cool. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think that's another reason why all the platforms are going to have to jump on to paying creators in some way, because it's true. You don't even have to have your own community now in some ways that uh, just creating really great content could possibly uh, end up getting monetized or helping another brand monetize. So paying creators, creators fairly is so important. Um, you know, if brands are making lots and lots of money off a of creator, they should be seeing some type of distribution from that money, in my opinion. And I 100% agree with you. So thank you so much. I just want to ask one more question and then we'll wrap it up. What's the biggest takeaway that you hope our listeners learn today? Um, I would say the biggest takeaway... I. I would say the biggest takeaway, it's kind of a two-parter, is one, to stay confident in yourself. Confidence, especially as an entrepreneur, um, is so important. If you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. Um, and then the second thing that I would say is really, really important is understanding the value of your time. I know I mentioned that a lot, but you know, if you're not the expert and you're not the best, then just outsource, outsource it to someone that is and understand that your time is so, so valuable. I love that. So I'll just recap for everyone what we talked about this podcast. So again, this is Madison Masterson of Mad Marketing. She is not only a CEO, she's an influencer, an independent contractor, a singer, and a model. 
Um, she talks about the importance of outsourcing, which I think is such a great lesson, you know, realize what you're best at and outsource the rest and that's okay. Also with influencing, she talks about the importance of having a call to action and networking and that's how she became really successful in her career. While also driving community and staying authentic to yourself, because as an influencer, you see um, how saturated the market is, the best thing you can do is just stay authentic to yourself and connect with your audience. Um, also, just putting put value to time. She talks a lot about how with compensation, you know, a lot of influencers don't get the correct compensation. So you have to know how valuable your time is. And I think that's a great lesson for honestly everyone, not just influencers, also just workers. And also, you know, sometimes there is toxicity that comes with social media. So you really have to put your mental health first. Um, when it comes to this job. But Madison, thank you so much for being on the podcast. If you want to tell our listeners where they can connect with you online. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. I would say the best place to connect with me online, Instagram at um, Madison M Music. Um, and then LinkedIn, if you just look up my name, Madison Masterson MS, um, you'll be able to find me there. Those are the best places to connect. And if you want to find us, we're at Gen Tech Marketing on all social media platforms. Thank you guys again. We'll talk to you next week.